Hi, welcome to Margaritas and Salsas. My name is Jamie Callison. I'm the uh, uh, executive chef and director of the Marriott Hospitality Culinary Innovation Center, which is a lot to say. Um, I'm going to introduce you to Blake and Corey uh, Preston, the owners of Etsy Bravo. Hi, man. Uh, Corey is Blake Preston. Um, we've been bartending uh, together for a cumulative total of 20 years. Um, started as bartenders and bar managers, and uh, now we own a bar called Etsy Bravo in downtown Pullman, and are working on uh, two others. And later, after Chef Jamie does this also, we'll be showing you our uh, garden margaritas. Perfect, so we're doing the margaritas last because they're gonna have ice in them, and um, for the film crew and for myself, we have to have a little taster, so we decided to do the salsas first. So, um, salsas, uh, there's a lot of different variations of salsa. I'm gonna go over three kind of main ones today. I'm gonna start with one of uh, my family's favorite is fish. We have fish tacos probably about once a week. It's like grilled mahi-mahi or, um, or our prawns. And we like to um, start with just a little bit of cabbage. So we've taken this cabbage and we shredded it really fine. I'm gonna put on some gloves and I'm gonna mainly put on gloves because here pretty soon I'm gonna be touching jalapenos. Um, and the oils from the jalapenos and the different peppers can get into your skin and that can be a little dangerous in terms of if you rub your eyes so we have our cabbage here that i've shredded really fine and then this is a little different that i add to it i took a little pickled ginger and um, basically sliced that really thin and then whatever juice a lot of people just throw away the juice from the pickled ginger it's absolutely amazing. So I like to, um, when I worked in big restaurants and we went through five gallon buckets of pickled um, ginger, we'd always save that liquid and make vinaigrettes with it because there's no reason to wait. It's amazing flavor. So we're gonna put uh, a little bit of that pickled ginger um, liquid in there with the pickled ginger. And then I have mangoes here. This is just fresh mango that I cut up. And mango, if you go to the store and you're, you're like, I wanna make fish tacos tonight and all the mangoes are rock hard, buy frozen um, and the frozen mangoes are, are really most really good quality um, but of course the fresh mangoes make an amazing salsa so I like to just cut those up about that size right there just kind of a large dice this might be a little aggressive on the mangoes but nobody's going to complain here so I have cilantro here that I've cut up and cilantro is really important that you um, when you wash cilantro that you we always get a big container with water and we submerge it in there and then dry it off. And sometimes you have to wash cilantro about three or four times um, until the water's totally clear. So we have rice wine vinegar here. A little bit of lime. Then I have just, a, I add a little bit of sugar just to kind of counter that rice wine vinegar and then a little bit of salt. I'm gonna mix this up. And it's a lot better if this salad sets for, I would say probably at least three hours. Um, it can set overnight. I don't really, with the acidity and the way the cabbage gets a little soggy, about three hours is perfect. This smells so good. I wish we had uh, a way to um, do smell a vision here sometimes. Uh, but it's a beautiful dressing, or beautiful salad, nice color. But this goes really good. We also do this a lot with um, seared ahi. We just take seared ahi um, and serve, we make like a um, sriracha aioli and serve that right with it. It's a, we're gonna put this into a bowl. And again, um, when we let things set, we're doing that because we wanna make sure that when you taste this salsa, that the mango is absolutely amazing. The pickled ginger is absolutely amazing. The cabbage is great. I don't wanna say plain cabbage is amazing because it's not. So cilantro, all these components are really, really good, but we want this to not just taste like when you're eating this, if we don't let this set for a little while, you're gonna taste mango, you're gonna taste pickled ginger, you're gonna taste cabbage, but as it sets, it kind of marries together and all those flavors are gonna become one. And that's really what um, kind of helps pull everything together. And then we're gonna go over the next, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our peppers and stuff that we have here. Definitely put on my gloves for this part. 
So we have an assortment of peppers here, and they definitely all have distinctive different flavors. So we have, everybody knows the jalapeno. Um, when we cut the jalapeno, what I'd like to do is I like to cut it and take it and cut. So I just cut that strip off like that. And that way I'm able to control the heat. I have this nice, easy to set down, nice and flat. So I'm gonna turn that. The majority of the heat, most of the time is right in here. If I'm just using jalapenos, a lot of times I'll cut this up into a paste until you can't even, resist the, you can't even see the seeds. I mean, they actually just turn into a, a total paste. And I do that so I can control the heat. If I just chop this up rough and I put seeds in there, you'd get a bite that would be really mild and you get another bite that would be extremely hot. So we want to control that. So then I just take my jalapenos and I set them down and I cut strips. It's like a julienne here. Then I take those and I turn them sideways. And we get that nice, that nice dice. I love these little, uh, uh, we call them bowls. They're, they're, we don't call them, they are, they're bowl scrapers, but they're great for cutting. So I can remove product from my knife without accidentally trying to um, maybe accidentally rub up against it. So then we have, just gonna kind of go over some of the, the basic prep items. We have our lime. It's really important to rinse it and take off that sticker. They make the stickers really hard to take off. And then to get the lime juice, what I like to do is I like to roll it and soften it up a little bit. That kind of softens up that lime juice in there. Now I'm gonna cut it in half, and I'm gonna cut it in half this way to squeeze the juice out. And then the limes are, um, a lot of people think a lime is a lime is a lime, but it's not. Uh, sometimes, this one's definitely a lot drier, and the flavor difference, we used the lime last night, and it was really strong. I have a feeling this one's not gonna be as, as good and strong. You can definitely tell this one's dry. So it's hard to use a recipe and say, oh, use just a half a lime. Uh, because, I mean, you can, because it's really easy to, to write that recipe, but the lime flavor, I always try to write a recipe that has a little bit less lime in there, and then you can add more if you need more. So, so I like to, you can use these little juicers to squeeze them out. Chefs normally just grab it and, and squeeze it just like this and, and we can get about the same amount of liquid out. But by using that little, these little things here, they work really good to get out any extra juice. So we have our lime juice there. I always like to keep, I'm gonna give you a lot, lots of little hints because that's just what I do because I teach for a living. I like to keep a bowl right by me and this bowl works great for putting all my compost in, if I have compost, um, if, I, if, I have, um, if I um, have just garbage, I'm gonna put that in, in the garbage, but I like having, comp we use compost a lot. So we have compost and I put a little bowl for garbage too. That way, every time you're, you're, when you're prepping something, you're not having to run to the garbage can or to the compost container uh, multiple times. Just helps keep me a little organized. So we have the sereno pepper here. This is my favorite pepper for the heat. So what I usually do is I'll use the jalapeno for the flavoring of the, um, uh, for the outside, the flesh, but I'll usually just take a sereno pepper and cut the whole thing up and mince this into a total paste. I love the flavor of the heat of the sereno pepper. So, um, I, so again, when I make a salsa, I'll buy jalapenos, but when I'm adding the heat in there, I'll just take this, I'll slice it really thin, and I'll cut this into a, a paste. The Fresno uh, uh, pepper here, it's great. Um, sometimes, I'm gonna bring this back over. Sometimes the heat from this uh, part of the pepper is really hot. And so I always suggest cutting a little piece off before you go to make a dish. Um, especially if it's an older pepper, the oils from the seeds, remember all the heat is generally right in here, right? But sometimes the seeds and the, the heat from the oils from the seeds and the white membrane here will leach out into the flesh of the jalapeno and you can end up making a batch of salsa that you think is gonna be really mild. And one time I put one jalapeno in about probably, I don't know, it's probably about eight cups of salsa 
And I thought, oh, I'm gonna taste it. And I didn't taste the flesh ahead of time, and it was unedible. It was so hot that we couldn't, uh, I mean, it was, it was a, and I like hot, kind of spicy food, and it was way over the top. So and then you have your habanero here. This is a pepper that um, when, it's, when it's used wrong, uh, it could be extremely hot. What I like doing, I love the flavor of the habanero pepper. Um, using the flesh and mincing this up into a paste and adding a little bit at a time is really helpful so that you can kind of control the flavor. Habanero, when you, um, when, you use, or when you use the right amount, it actually gets hot and then it, that heat starts to dissipate. When you use too much, it just gets hotter and hotter and hotter and it's um, not enjoyable. So I definitely have some stories um, uh, as a chef of when people would abuse that and we didn't warn the guests in time. So we have our tomatillo here. We're gonna go over the here. This tomatillo is, it's a green tomato. It definitely does not taste like a tomato. Um, it has this hard uh, skin on the outside. So we're usually gonna take this and we're gonna wash this off. Um, and then I always roast these. So there's the core here. So I take this here. And my favorite way to do this is just right on the barbecue. So if I'm outside, I won't even cut it. I'll just roast it right on the barbecue. Um, you can put a little oil on it, but it gives a great flavor, especially for salsas, which we're gonna make here in a second. But you can see the color that I got here. And the, the roasting does a couple of things. Of course, caramelization adds flavor. And I know in the, in the, what you can see right now, it looks really dark. It's not that dark. This is nice golden brown. It's not burnt. If you burn it, you're gonna get bitter flavors. So we browned it really good. It's gonna help kind of cut that acidity and kind of mellow out the flavor uh, of the tomatillo. And then we have our tomato. Um, for salsas and stuff, it's really, really hard to find um, during some times of the year, a tomato that actually tastes like a tomato. These tomatoes actually I picked today, they actually smell like tomatoes. Um, but if you're looking for to make a salsa and you can't find a tomato that actually has an aroma of a tomato, there's nothing wrong with using canned tomato products. Canned tomatoes are actually picked ripe. They're canned within a couple hours. Um, most sauces like in Italian restaurants and a lot of restaurants will use a certain brand from a certain region because uh, the flavor doesn't come from um, picking it green and putting it in a warehouse and gassing it. The flavor comes from the soil and from the sun and from all the nutrients that, that comes out of the tomato. So, a, a tomato, unless you're getting a really good quality tomato, a lot of times canned tomatoes are way better. Um, all Italian restaurants, I go to Italy almost every year, all the really high-end restaurants use a canned tomato product for their sauces from a certain region. Now, of course, when you go pick a tomato from your garden and you, or, or you get a local tomato and it's fresh, of course it's gonna be better, right? Um, however, most of the time of the year, a canned tomato product is going to give you a better result on a lot of, a lot of different dishes. Of course, the texture is not perfect for like a, a certain sandwiches and certain things, but these tomatoes actually, have, I picked these up today and they actually smell like a tomato, which is kind of exciting. So for a tomato, I wash this. I like to core both sides and you can buy these little cores for, this was like 99 cents. So there's usually a little brown spot on this part of it. So I'm just going to take that out. Then you have your, uh, your core on the other side. So we're gonna do this. And the nice thing when we do this right at the beginning, we have zero waste. So, and it's a lot less work than trying to cut around that little piece of um, core if you wait to um, slice the tomato first. So when I'm using this for salsa, I like to take my tomato. I like to just do slices like this. So just almost like you're, what, exactly like what you're doing for a sandwich. Be a little careful, like I can hold on to the tomato pretty, pretty good. If it starts getting too wobbly, you can actually take it. Be really careful to put your hand up like this, not down like this. And you can just take your knife and again, make sure your hand's not on the cutting board. It's actually up over the tomato like this and just cut through it because it's really hard to cut that tomato when it's setting up. Now what I like to do, I love a, a pico. I love fresh tomatoes and, and a, more of a pico de gallo. So I'm gonna cut my tomatoes. So I cut them in strips. They don't really stay in strips, but I'm gonna turn those. And then some of my tomato, I like to cut a lot smaller. I like that kind of mixture of the, the bigger pieces and the smaller pieces. So 
So we're just gonna cut that up. But again, the nice thing, look at this, because we cored that out, we don't have to cut around that. It's just ready to go. So there's no waste. We're dicing that up. And I love this fresh tomato type salsa. But again, if, if I can't find a fresh tomato, using really good quality canned tomatoes, you're gonna get a better result. And people always, <laughs> they're like, a chef is telling us to use canned tomatoes? I can't believe this. So um, this is some tomatoes I diced up early. I gotta make sure my crew, the, the film crew, and um, maybe give um, Corey and Blake a little um, salsa to take home for coming in and, and working with us today. So I have my tomatoes in here. So what I like to do too is we call it mise en place. So I have everything totally lined up, ready to go. So I have my jalapenos cut. Now, normally, um, if I'm making a salsa, I'm not gonna dirty up a bunch of different containers. But if I'm doing something like this where I wanna make sure I have all the ingredients and also I'm having to show you how to put it into there. Um, but it's really important, especially if you're cooking something, we would actually line everything up as it was gonna go into the dish. This normally, I would not dirty all these containers. I would just start prepping and, and putting everything right in there, but just to show you an illustration. So I have my jalapenos, but, and a lot of you are gonna be like, that's a lot of jalapenos, but there's no heat in here. This is all flavor. Garlic, cilantro, lime juice. Now I have some of those sereno peppers that I cut really, really fine. I'm gonna put a little bit of that in. Actually, I'm just gonna go for it. I actually taste them, they're not overly hot, so. Now, I know I'm gonna need a little bit of salt, but we're just gonna add a tiny bit of salt. Because we can always add more salt later. And whenever I'm first teaching people how to cook from scratch, they're always amazed at how much salt we start with. And it's because we start with zero salt. So when I'm seasoning this, there's no salt in here yet. So just for time's sake, I'm not gonna taste this, and I forgot my tasting spoons anyway, so that's okay, to be honest with you. So um, normally now I will taste this for, it may need more acidity, it might need a little bit more um, salt. Um, the heat, I'm gonna let it set for a little while. And salsa like this is really important so let it set for a, a good, again, a good couple hours. Actually, I love salsa like this when it sets overnight. All those flavors from the garlic and everything really kind of married together. And with these sauces, it's really, really, salsas, it's really important to think about that component because if you don't, again, you're gonna taste tomato and all those things separately. For a pico, the other thing, I'm not gonna do it right now, but I love putting a little bit of shredded cabbage in some of it. Adds a lot of texture um, and of course, flavor too, so. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this into a bowl just to have an illustration there. Get our beautiful salsa. What I'll usually do is I'll usually pull some of this salsa out and um, for people and, and put, make some spicy. Like if I have people coming over my house, make some spicy. And then, um, so I pull some out that's not without the, um, uh, Sereno pepper chopped up really fine. And then I'll put that, as, put that aside and then I'll make spicy, put it in different color bowls and make sure people know so that that way, there's a lot of people that really don't like any spice. And so that way we have both. Okay. I'm gonna go on to my um, tomatillo salsa here, which is my favorite. So again, we have our tomatillos that are, are cut really, that are, I cut in half and I did this because I did this in a, um, I cooked these in a saute pan with just a little bit of oil um, and a tiny bit of salt. So they start releasing some of that moisture, um, which helps them brown better. Clean up my mess here. So I'm gonna put this right into a blender. I can put that up here on the cutting board. So James isn't having to move the film, the camera around too much. So we're gonna put these right into a blender I think I have too small of a blender, but we'll see if we can make this work. You guys like how this is crimson? So I'm gonna pulse this. That means it's just not turning it on and letting it run. I'm gonna do that and then I'm gonna be able to add some more of these peppers in there. 
This is getting really slippery. There we go. So I'm gonna add a little bit of salt in here. One of my favorite ways um, to make this salsa too is it's a lot simpler version. Add a little bit of salt in there. Is actually just taking these and putting them on the barbecue, taking some dried chilies and um, using like a pesto mortar and actually just ch chopping them up a little bit of salt and making them into a salsa. Just very plain is really, really good. We're gonna add a few more things to it today. So we end up with this nice, beautiful green color there. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna add the onions in here. And I don't wanna chop these onions up very much. I'm gonna add my jalapenos in there. And this is gonna be really full. I'm gonna add my cilantro, my lime juice. And I added very little salt, so I'm gonna go ahead and add just a little bit more salt to this. This container is way too small, but that's okay. I'm gonna add my, uh, again, my uh, serrano peppers. Now this is an important part that I do not want to over chop. I'm just gonna pulse it a couple times. My onions were diced really small. I'm just trying to get all these ingredients to blend together. Beautiful. I'm gonna go ahead and put this right in here. Normally, again, I would taste this. This is beautiful. This is definitely my favorite salsa. That nice, beautiful green color. Gotta leave some room on here for some margaritas. So I'm gonna clean up my area just a little bit and then I'm gonna show you a technique for guacamole. So there's so many people that, um, that kind of overcomplicate guacamole. I really believe that guacamole should be simple. You have so many flavors going on with all those other salsas. Um, two things I love to do with this avocado. I love dicing it and adding it to that salsa verde. It really adds, and you can also add some to the um, mango um, salsa. So when you're cutting an avocado, this is some of the worst cuts I've ever seen in a commercial kitchen. If somebody will take an avocado like this and they'll turn it like this in their hand, I say set it down on the cutting board and just turn it. See how I have the knife in there? And I'm just turning that around. This is the other cut that I see a lot. People will put this in their hands and I've seen people cut through this right here and it's miss and they cut the palm of their hand, um, it can be really dangerous. So set it down. Again, there's no reason why not to set it down. And then you can just turn it. And then I take this to the edge of the cutting board and then pop that off, because trying to pull that off can be really dangerous too. So then I'm able, I, I basically just cut that in half again. Most of the time you're able just to kind of take this skin. It, it doesn't always work, especially when you're on video. It hardly ever works. So this is amazing, this is working and I'm able to pull this off. I like doing it this way because now if I wanted to dice this for my um, salsa, it's, I can actually just cut it in strips and dice it really nice, right? This is a beautiful avocado. It's a little underripe, but... And a great way to tell if an avocado is um, ripe, you have to be a little careful now because, you know, with, with COVID and stuff. So I usually just grab one of the bags um, uh, one of the grocery bags and I actually put it kind of use it as a glove and I'll take an avocado and I'll feel it and if it's a little soft right here not if you feel pockets in the avocado that's bad because those pockets are going to create brownness in the avocado so if you feel like it's like you can really push on it it's kind of hollow don't buy that avocado if it's green you're gonna have to take it home you're gonna have to wait a few days right so look for the color that dark darker color and kind of push on it a little bit. And so again, you don't want to do this at the grocery store just with the bare hands. So I just take the bag that I'm going to put it in, turn it upside and turn it inside out and just kind of feel the avocados and pick my avocado that way. So, so for our guac, I'm just going to put this in here and I'm just going to, again, these are a little under, under ripe. So they're going to fight with me a little bit, but I'll, I'll win unless one goes shooting across. 
So I'm just going to kind of use a spoon. And these are going to give me a little bit of a battle just because they're, they're a little hard, but that's what they had at Safeway today. So normally I would have tried to try to pick these a couple days before so I could control. So I'm going to add a bit of salt. And we're going to add a little bit of lime juice. Be really careful on the lime juice. If you put too much lime juice in guacamole, it gets a weird kind of metallic flavor. A little bit of lime is amazing. And I'm sure most of you have heard about the, the term salt fat acid, right? So many people love guacamole because you have the fat from the avocado, right? You have the salt that we put in here, and then you have the acid from the lime. So it's really the, the perfect combination of ingredients, and that's why a lot of people love guacamole. Now this, for me, I'm done. I'm not going to add anything else to the guacamole. Now, of course, if you're just serving it with chips and salsa, maybe putting in tomatoes, um, jalapenos, whatever you want. It's your day, right? I mean, you can make it however you want. What I like doing, though, is I like having a little bit of contrast. So if I have all these big flavors with all these other dishes, the, the guacamole gives it kind of this natural, kind of clear, fun flavor. So instead of having, it kind of helps balance out the dish. So, But again, um, add a little bit of the acid and then a little bit more at a time until you get that perfect balance. Um, and then when you want to store this, I've had people say, put the pit in there. I've tried it that way. It doesn't really help. The main thing is to put it in a container, a really uh, smallest container as you can possibly find and put uh, plastic wrap on top of it and push the plastic wrap directly down on the, um, the avocado and it works extremely well. So that you have the lime in there, which is gonna help it from turning brown. All right, we have one more item and that is chips. Um, when I first um, met my wife and I made dinner for her and her family and, and I was like, well, we're gonna make some homemade tortilla chips. They're like, you can't make homemade tortilla chips. It's like, well, I'm not making homemade tortillas, but I'm just buying extra thin, and it's really important. Even if you like really thick tortillas, you want to buy the extra thin if you're wanting to make chips. Um, in the restaurants, actually, when we buy these, they're actually about twice as, well, they're way drier than this, and they're even thinner than this, because we actually want to get rid of that moisture. So we're going to take those. And it's such a big difference having um, chips that you make from scratch compared to, um, this is just a little sanitizer to clean off my knife, compared to chips that you buy in the store. The texture and the flavor is way different. So we're going to cut these in half this way, then we're going to lay them down, and then I'm going to cut them in thirds. So now we have our chips. This is the tricky part. I'm going to bring you back over here. We have our fryer. And thank goodness it's still on because this messes up all the time. We're going to take our chips and we have to make sure when we set them down in there that we actually separate them out a little bit as we're setting them in there. Because if we set them in and just in a stack like this, they're going to stick together. So when we drop them in here, we're going to make sure that we drop them in and we're kind of separating them out a little bit as we go. We're going to drop the basket and this is a really important stage. You want to move them around and make sure they're not sticking and that they're getting evenly coated with that fat. And now we're gonna watch, um, it's hard for you guys to see, but they'll actually stop, we're getting a lot of bubbles right now, and they'll stop bubbling, because um, that's the moisture coming out of them, and they'll start to turn brown, just slightly brown. And you wanna cook these at about 360 degrees. Now I'm gonna pull them out and I'm gonna let them drain just a little bit. But while there's still a little grease on there, I'm gonna drop them into my bowl and we're gonna add a little salt to it. And the reason we add the salt to it now with that little bit of grease on there is that grease is gonna help the salt stick to your chips. And so again, we're not adding a lot and you have to be careful as you're making your chips. If you get a lot of salt in the bottom of your bowl and you're tossing them, um, you can end up with really salty chips. So really watch as you're tossing them. If you start to get too much salt down there, either wipe it off or just don't put any in for a little bit. But you can keep the same bowl and keep on adding chips to it. And I don't know if you can hear that. That's a beautiful sound. They'll be a little soft right when they come out of the fryer. Um, but you don't want them 
these are nice and crunchy. As they cool down a little bit, they're actually gonna get even a little bit drier. So, but you wanna hear that. I'm trying to get it close to my mic. You wanna hear that sound. So I think it's time for margaritas. You guys ready? Let's do it. All right. Thanks, Chef. You're welcome. Uh, today we're gonna show you our garden margarita. <clears throat> uh, we think the garden margarita is a great, uh, great drink to have in your home arsenal. Um, it's flexible, it's fun. Um, if you're making something like salsa, you've got extra mangoes, extra jalapenos, you toss them in there. If you've got mint growing in the garden, go pick it, toss it in there. Uh, the point of the garden margarita is it starts with a, a solid backbone first. Um, you get the primary flavors dialed and balanced first, and then you can throw in whatever secondary flavors you feel like. Um, we talk about the, the fundamentals of a good cocktail. Um, you have a good cocktail, it's not because there's a lot of ingredients, it's because the ingredients that are in there are balanced. So our garden margarita, um, the, the fundamentals of it, it, it's inspired by a bartender named Julio Bermejo, who was a bartender at Tommy's Mexican Restaurant in San Francisco. Uh, in the 90s, you know, the, the margarita had kind of uh, warped into what it was, um, and what it was was bad tequila being covered up by bulk uh, sour mix, being covered up with artificially flavored orange triple sec, um, orange juice, it, it had just become a mess. And Julio was the first one to kind of step back and say, that's not the point of this drink. The point of this drink is to uh, highlight the wonderful flavors that are actually happening in tequila, not cover them up. Uh, so he ditched the sour mix, he ditched the triple sec, and he replaced um, those things with fresh lime juice and agave nectar. Um, now we say, you know, you want to, uh, the point of the margarita is to, to highlight the tequila. Um, you only want to highlight a good tequila, and a good tequila is pretty easy to find. As long as you're looking for a tequila that says 100% agave on it, you're in good shape. Um, so that's the backbone um, of this margarita. The margarita, uh, Tommy's margarita, is built on a simple uh, sour um, method. So that just means two parts spirit, one part acidic juice, which is either just lemon or lime, and one part sweet. So you swap the tequila with whiskey, you swap the lime with lemon, uh, swap the agave with simple syrup, you have a whiskey sour. Swap the tequila with rum, you've got a daiquiri, and so on and so forth. You know, you can, you can really, with this one recipe, you can, you can make a hundred different cocktails. Um, so we're gonna start with the backbone, the two-on-one simple sour with tequila. We like to use these jiggers. It's, it's simply two ounces on one end, one ounce on the other end. So we start with our two, which is the two spirit. We were talking earlier, a, a tequila is not a tequila. It's, um, it's terroir driven. So depending on where the agave is grown, um, you can taste that region in it. Um, it all has to come from the Mexican state of Jalisco. Uh, but the tequila, tequila, the blue agave that's grown in the lowlands has kind of a herbal vegetal taste. Uh, when it's grown in the highlands of Jalisco, it's, it's grown in clay soil and it's uh, got kind of a sweeter, more robust taste. Um, so you can kind of play with that to, uh, to customize your, your margarita. So we've got our two ounces spirit of tequila. We like to use these. Um, you can use a fork, you can use your hand, you can do it however you want, as long as you just get one ounce of tequila out of it, or excuse me, lime juice out of it. And when using these jiggers, you wanna make sure you're, you're going to the, tip, the tippy top <laughs> and getting as, as much on the table as you can. That's pretty standard. What's nice about using these, uh hand juicers over the drink as you're getting the fresh oils from outside of the lime, which adds another layer of depth to your margarita, which is always good. All right, so one, one full ounce of your lime, your acidic element, and then agave nectar. So blue agave syrup, the uh, same ingredient that the tequila is distilled from. You can get this at any grocery store. Um, we've had success with, with any brand. If it's too uh, thick, you can cut it with a little bit of water. 
Um, if it's too rich, you can go for an amber syrup, but you can find it anywhere. Oh, oh here's. All right, shake it. We always shake cocktails that have juice in them. When cocktails are just uh, spirit forward, we'll stir those. So get about half full of ice. Dump your cocktail in there. Little tap to make sure it's secure and go to town. If you're making this at home, usually ice at home is a little more durable than restaurant ice, so you can really take this for as long as you want, especially with this being a uh, clear spirit. You're not going to lose any of the complexity of aging or barrels. And then we are going to taste. <laughs> we so. always, like Chef Jamie was talking about, you always want to give a little taste to whatever you're doing because uh, you know, the limes are always different. Um, the syrup could have been made differently. So the 2 one one the recipe is the starting point, but you want to have the, the flexibility to adjust. This one's perfect. We don't need to adjust. All right. And we like to salt the rim of our glasses. They'll take a lime wedge, get the half of the glass we usually like to do, a little wet the lime and then just kind of dunk it in a plate of salt. Right. Doing half the glass, give, glass gives you a bit of freedom so not every sip you have a mouthful of salt which is nice sometimes but sometimes you want to break and then we'll just dump it all in. little garnish. Our rule is whatever citrus we put in the drink, we garnish it with that same citrus. So since we use lime juice, we'll use a lime wedge. It's also nice if you're making this for friends. If your palate, when you taste it, is a bit sweeter, that you can use the lime, add a little more acid to adjust it to their palate. And we're all done with this one. So that's, that's the backbone of, of the garden margarita. Um, that's the two-on-one. Um, that's the structure. Going back to um, simpler is usually better. With a simple cocktail that's balanced, you end up tasting more layers than you would with a cocktail that you try to kind of force these layers in with extra ingredients. Um, start with a good backbone, and you can go from there. So with a, the garden mar margarita as aspect, um, Again, we'll go back to our, our two on one. Two ounces of tequila. If you're, um, the, the margarita should be fun and, and flexible and not overthought. And you know, if you're, if you're traveling, if you're at a hotel and you didn't bring your shakers and strainers and squeezers and muddlers with you. Uh, just a, a bottle of seltzer water. The point of shaking it is to uh, chill it and dilute it. But if you just uh, put the drink over ice, top it with some seltzer water, you're doing the same thing. That's nice Thank you. Two ounces of tequila. Halfway on this side since this is two. This is one ounce of fresh lime. of agave nectar. So now you know you have a strong uh, backbone in your cocktail and you can start to have a little fun with it. Um, we've got some pineapples. We've got some jalapenos left over from the salsa. This tool is pretty handy, but again, you don't need it. Use the back of a, a knife or a 
a spoon. An ice cream scoop. Ice cream scoop. That's what we use at home. <laughs> so really mash all that stuff in there. If you're using fresh herbs, you want to be a, a little more thoughtful with the, the muddling. You don't want to bruise them, as they say it. Otherwise, you get kind of this uh, chlorophyll -y or or uh, just, just not good flavor. So instead of muddling herbs, you won't just want to shake it with a drink just a little bit to let the oils out. we're using juice, we're going to shake. So halfway up with ice, dump everything in there, make sure there's a nice seal, and then shake. Going back to what Blake said earlier, you, you kind of want to, you want to reference what's in the cocktail with the garnish. So we don't want to surprise anyone with a really spicy cocktail. So we'll garnish it with jalapeno. So they, there's some indication that, you know, wh what they're getting into. Oh, you? What? Oh, just me taste? Yeah. <laughs> it's spicy. It's good. <laughs> cool. All right, then once again, Dump this. Sweet. Garnish. So garden margarita. And again, the point of it's to be flexible, to use what you have, but as long as the fundamentals are there, it's gonna be a good drink. Um, Making that uh, non-alcoholic uh, is uh, even easier, even more straightforward. You're basically just ditching the tequila and adding soda water. Um, you do want to cut it with something, otherwise, you know, you're gonna end up with this just really constant, it'll taste like lemonade concentrate, limeade concentrate. Um, and we can actually just build this one in the glass so you don't have a shaker. Of a nectar. Lime juice. What's nice about this recipe is it translates so well with a no alcohol that if you aren't drinking, you don't feel left out at all because it's the same uh, process, just not adding the alcohol. soda to cut it. If you put the ice in before the soda, the soda just kind of ends up floating on top. So soda first. that it's spicy. Virgin Garden Margarita. And there you have it. Simple is better. That's it.
Well, I don't know about you, but um, I'm definitely thirsty right now. Um, those mar uh, margaritas absolutely look beautiful. Um, I do want to um, thank um, Blake and Corey for coming and, and, and helping host this event, uh, for Jason Butcher Wright for putting all this together, and then for, of course, Ken, not forget our um, uh, James out there um, filming that we keep really busy. So I um, want to thank all of you for coming. Um, hopefully you enjoyed this um, presentation, and um, go Cougs. So, Thank mm -hmm. you.